She's the daughter of Candace Cameron Bure and may be best known as a YouTube celebrity and contestant on The Voice. Natasha Bure joins us to discuss navigating the teenage years, handling real issues like faith, friends, and boys on today's 700 Club Interactive. Good morning and welcome to the show. You know, we all know the teenage years can be a difficult and confusing time. Social pressures and the desire to fit in often cause anxiety. I guess that goes for adults too. And that's why a life of authenticity and being real is always the best way. Natasha Bure grew up as the daughter of actress Candace Cameron Bure and NHL forward Valerie Bure. She started singing when she was 10 years old. Since then, Natasha has added modeling, YouTube celebrity, and contestant on The Voice to her resume. But as an 18-year-old, she still deals with typical teenage issues, like friends, boys, and struggling with her faith. Natasha's book, Let's Be Real, features her candid, personal stories as she offers advice to young girls on handling tough stuff in a hectic world. Well, Natasha Bure joins us now. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. I know you're tired of the question, but it is so unusual for people to, to look at you. I mean, the circumstances that your dad is a famous hockey player, mm -hmm. your mother's a famous actress. That's yes. a very unusual way to grow up. What was yes. that like? Yes. I think um, it was definitely, it, it, I can't say it wasn't different, because it definitely was different. But at the same time, I grew up in a normal household. My parents had rules for me. Um, and I, we didn't really enter a lot of the spotlight until I was a little bit older. So for the most part of growing up, it was pretty normal. When you guys were in the spotlight, did you ever wish you could have your family more to yourself instead of sharing them with, you know, people who watch your mom on TV or people who watch your dad in hockey? Sometimes there's certain times where I feel like my parents are working and I wish they were home with me or I wish they weren't out um, doing other things. But at the same time, I'm, you know, they work so hard and they're so passionate about everything that they do. So I'm, you know, I'm a little fine with it. <laughs> and now through social media, you've achieved notoriety on your own and you're your own person yes, now. What's that been like? Oh, it's been amazing to find my niche and to find things that I'm very passionate about and to pursue those things. It's been, it's been a, a journey, but it's been very rewarding. And what are those things that you're passionate about? Music, modeling, acting, all of those things um, definitely weren't always a huge interest when I was younger I wanted to become a professional athlete and I wanted to play tennis and that was what I thought I was gonna do and when I turned 10 I kind of switched gears and I found it in my own way it wasn't something that was ever pushed on me or was ever forced upon me which um, is nice because it was something that came from my heart and something that I was passionate about so you've made an interesting discovery to young age you're 18 yes and a lot of your book centers on the fact that social media and all that comes with it it's, there's a lot of phoniness out there Absolutely. and how, how we present ourselves. Talk about what you've discovered along the way. For me, I've had social media since I was 15. So I've, I was young when I started it and my following has just grown so much since I started it. And I started to see this trend of how um, we all compare each other to the next photo we see on Instagram or the next tweet or the next YouTube video. And you're only seeing a small a snippet of somebody's life. And people were beginning to compare their lives to mine, uh, saying things like, oh, you have the perfect life or, you know, um, you know, you seem like you have it all figured out. In reality, I'm thinking to myself, I don't have it figured out. Um, I'm still growing as a woman and I'm still learning about myself. And so I wanted to not set an example of I have the perfect life, but hey, I have flaws and I have things that I have issues with. And I wanted to be open and honest about those things and kind of say, you know, social media isn't always real. Natasha, help me, okay? I've got yes. three children. <laughs> my boys are 11 and 10. A little girl's about to be six. So for my family, we're going to be entering in very soon to the social media realms with kids and all they yes. do with social media, et cetera. I feel like some parents out there are overcautious. Maybe they're just thinking too much about the dangers out there for kids on social media, what they're posting, what they're reading. And then other parents are out to lunch. They don't have a clue what's going on. They don't have a clue technically how to operate anything. What do you think parents of, of teenagers or soon to be teens need to know about the possible dangers? Out yes. There? Uh, my parents were always very strict in that they had all my passwords, they had to approve the photos that I posted. How did you feel about that? At first, I was upset. I obviously didn't want my parents to have full access of all of my social media. I wanted it to be my own. But now that I'm older and I know the kind of example I want to set, I'm so glad because what you put out online, it, it can stay out there forever. And it's a scary world. world. Social media is very scary. And so I'm glad that I had parents who were very firm and strict about that. And I think because of that, now 
obviously I'm 18 years old and they're much more lenient about me doing other things, but I think that it's um, important that parents be cautious when teenagers are going and starting into the social media world because it can be scary. And I think that at the same time, it is important to let teenagers know that you know, it's their learning experience and it's for them to find out um, how the world works at the same time. So how do you encourage your followers and your friends to stay real in a culture that really kind of forces people to suggest they adapt to what someone else views as popular, et cetera? For me, I always strive to be the best version of myself that I can be. And being authentic is taking the parts about Natasha that is unique, that are special, that um, make me who I am and enhancing them and, and growing myself into, you know, a more intelligent woman and to someone who I want to become and not looking at the person next to me and thinking, I wish I could be them or I want to strive to be just like them because you can never be the best somebody else, but you can be the best you. So for me, it's just striving each and every day to be that person. One thing that really shines through in your book, especially like the last third of the book, is really devoted to your faith. Absolutely. And how it seems like you really seem to try and identify yourself and who God says you are. Yeah, faith has been a huge part of my life since I was really little. I grew up in a Christian home and um, was raised to have a relationship with God. And when I was a little bit older, I think I had to take ownership of my relationship with God. And that wasn't always easy. That was a time in my life where I definitely struggled and I mm -hmm. still struggle today. It's I'm not gonna say that it's smooth sailing for the rest mm -hmm. of my life. <laughs> Obviously, there's gonna be bumps in the road. Particularly in your ninth grade year, I believe you talked about yes. it. It was a tough season for you. Yeah, there was a, a season in my life where I just didn't feel like myself. I wasn't bubbly, I wasn't happy. I. Uh, didn't really know where I stood with my relationship with God. And, and your I parents think, noticed, right? Absolutely. I think it was very apparent to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I think I just was not in the Word. I wasn't praying. I wasn't who I want to be. And um, I think for me to pretend that that didn't happen um, isn't beneficial for any reason. I think if anything, I would want to use that experience knowing that I've grown out of that and that I've, um, you know, have such a strong relationship with my faith to tell other girls that it's okay if there's bumps in the road. So what changed for you? You were in that season of struggle. Your parents noticed, people noticed. What kind of turned it around? I took some time away from being with my family and it was um, this particular season in my life happened towards the end of ninth grade so it was going into summer and there was this Christian sports camp that a lot of my parents friends send their kids to every summer it's just like a summer camp so they said you know maybe it's it's a good idea um, for you to just go be by yourself and just live you know a fun summer and you don't we don't want the stress of you being around us and um, there was just a lot of tension at home so I was really um, you know, kind of eager to get away from them. So I went to camp and really worked on my relationship with God and found um, some really great influences and friends and people who poured into me and encouraged me. And from there, um, I just saw how drastically my life changed. And then it could be a tough adjustment, right? A few weeks after getting home, you're out of that environment, you're back to the same friends and pressures, and to try and keep that walk going can be challenging sometimes. Absolutely. We have this term at camp called the camp high, where you know you are encouraged and you're so surrounded by people who believe in the same things as you, and when you come back, it could be oftentimes difficult to adjust to being in a very different circumstance where you really have to defend your faith on your own, and that can be difficult, and something especially um, for me, being in LA, that's definitely difficult because I'm not always surrounded by people who um, have a faith and who have a relationship with God. The book also gives a little sneak peek, just as we conclude here, uh, into your family's life a little bit. I loved how you made a special point that in your household, in your in your parents' household, absolutely no profanity. No, None. no profanity. It's a very strict rule since I was very little. You learned that lesson quick. I did. I did. Appreciate you sharing with us. And I would yes. encourage anyone who is the parent of a teen that this is a great resource for you. Natasha's book is called Let's Be Real, Living Life as an Open and Honest Jew. It's available now and you can pick up a copy wherever books are sold. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. God bless you. Well, up next, he was born with a one in a million heart defect, leaving his parents searching for answers. What could I have done differently? How could I have caused this? Is it something in our environment that caused it and your mind starts to race on the what-if scenarios. Don't miss this miraculous story. That's when we return. Andrew Turnbull hadn't even been born and yet his chance at living was not good. He had one lung and his heart was on the wrong side of his body. At best, 
His prognosis was grim. Take a look. We were definitely excited. It was going to be our second child. It was going to be very fun and interesting to add a son to the mix. On April 8th, 2005, Doug and Audrey Turnbull welcomed their first son, Andrew, into the world. It's hard to describe. I mean, it's, it's a euphoria, it's peace, a comfort, uh, and great, great excitement. Since Audrey had a C-section, she was still lying on the table as nurses took the baby aside for assessment. After a few minutes, she realized she hadn't heard him cry. It took a while for the cry to come, but then when he did make his first cry, it was actually a muffled cry. I even said, wow, his cry sounds really funny. Meanwhile, nurses noted that the newborn's skin wasn't turning pink, a sign he was having trouble getting enough oxygen. They put him in an incubator, hoping it would help. They actually wheeled him in the incubator to me. Uh, it was just like a little hood over his head, so I could at least see him, but they only let him stay at my side for at least a minute or less. They then decided, we, we need to get him down to the NICU. Doctors at Women's Hospital of Texas admitted Andrew to the neonatal intensive care unit. X-rays revealed that his heart was on the wrong side of his chest and one of his lungs was underdeveloped. Further testing showed extreme pressure in his lungs, preventing his body from getting the oxygen it needed. In that moment, it's hard to wrap your mind around the real depth and complexity of the actual health problems that he had. The next day, Andrew was transported to Texas Children's Hospital next door, where he was diagnosed with scimitar syndrome. It's a rare condition where major organs are displaced. In Andrew's case, he had two veins going from his lungs into the wrong side of his heart, limiting the flow of oxygen. Dr. Charlita Guillory was Andrew's neonatologist. You could have organ failure, any organ, the kidneys, the brain, any organ could be affected as a result of that. He was in the group of babies that had the highest mortality, morbidity, at risk for not surviving. We had this feeling of spiraling. It's like that drain that spirals. Over the next two days, Andrew's oxygen levels continued to drop. At that particular time, we were doing the maximal therapy we could give to Andrew. And we knew in order to do more, we needed to do a cardiac cath or an MRI, but Andrew was so sick, we knew we couldn't move him to do the tests that we needed to do. One of the surgeons at one point said, we don't have a game plan, so to take him to an operating room without knowing how he's wired, we, we may lose him on the table because we just don't know what, what we're dealing with. Audrey tried to make sense of what was happening. What could I have done differently? How could I have caused this? Is it something in our environment that caused it? And your mind starts to race on the what if scenarios. It's scary. The unknown is very scary. Doug and Audrey held on by faith and asked friends and relatives to pray. We had people from all over the United States um, that were able to call across, you know, prayer chains and churches across all denominations. And when you realize there's nothing that you can physically do for him but pray, then that's all we have to do. Four days after Andrew was born, Audrey and Doug received the news they feared most. The doctor came out with tears streaming down her face and said, he, he's just not gonna make it through the day. So, uh, <sighs> she said, call whoever you want, family, but he probably will not make it through the day. So that's when it, that's when it hit you as a dad. All I could do was internally just pray, pray for my own strength, pray for wisdom and pray for guidance. Then, during the night, Andrew's oxygen levels began to stabilize. He began to gradually improve without us changing anything, and certainly without surgery, he began to improve. The improvement was so drastic, doctors were able to wean him off of medications and machines. You don't even know what to do after you've heard, you know, the, the exciting news that he has. 
a probability now of making it. Andrew's MRI showed that his vital organs had not been damaged. After six weeks in the hospital, he went home. <laughs> Today, Andrew is a healthy, active 11-year-old. While his doctors still keep an eye on him, he's had no residual problems. I would consider um, Andrew's recovery an awesome blessing. All you can say is, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I do believe Andrew's miracle is an act of God because there was no other way he would have survived. We celebrate what happened in Andrew's life and his healing, but perhaps you're at a point right now where that precious family was, where they said all we can do was pray. They were told that precious boy may not make it through the day. I remember seeing my son in the NICU, and those are hard, hard moments. And for me in that season, that week of my life in which my son was in the NICU, I reflect back on that and I see that was a week in that I was really able to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. That scripture came alive to me in the toughest season of my life because God did reveal himself in some very, very powerful ways. And if you're in a season like that now with struggle, it's my privilege to pray with you now. And if you've overcome something recently in your life, pray with me for those that are struggling. Let's, let's join together in prayer for people that are hurting. Father God, we see your miraculous power. We see your power to heal. We see your love, Father God. But many in this audience are in a season where they feel they're in the desert, whether it's physical healing for themselves or a loved one, whether it's salvation for someone they're praying for, Father, whether it's just a spirit of fear and anxiety, whether it's a financial ruin and they're desperate, Lord. You know the cries of our heart. You know the cries of our heart. And Lord, I pray now for members of the audience who desperately need a touch from you. I'm here to remind them that you are faithful and you are good, that you love us no matter what we've done or what our circumstances are. Lord, if our circumstances are trying right now, I pray you will reveal yourself to those who need to see your goodness, who used to know it and now are saying, Lord, where are you? Father, let this moment right now remind them of your goodness, your love, and your mercy, and that you will never leave us nor forsake us. So, Father God, I pray for answered prayer. You hear the cries of the heart of the audience, Lord God. I pray, Lord, you will reveal yourself in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you need further prayer, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Well, coming up, a pivotal point in a boy's life. Day I came home, and all my dad's clothes were stacked up on the couch. I remember my mother telling me that my dad wasn't going to live in our house anymore. Very powerful story. Find out how that day sent him on a downward spiral and what it would take to bring him back. Don't go away. Well, have you ever received a gift and wondered, what am I going to do with this? Well, that's what happened to Nate Eckelberger, only he realized the value of the gift he'd been given many years later. I had this ongoing joke I'd tell my friends, has anyone ever told you that God is always there beside you or behind you to support you? And of course, the kids were like, yeah, yeah, I've heard that. And I'd just punch the air behind me. I'd punch it behind me and beside me. Because he was always there beside you, he was close enough to hit him, to be mad at him. I should be mad at him for what had happened to me. I had what I felt like was a perfect life. My dad was a barber. My mom was a nurse. There was fighting here and there. But to me, as a 10-year-old, it seemed like a regular family. One day I came home, when all my dad's clothes were stacked up on the couch. I remember my mother telling me that my dad wasn't gonna live in our house anymore. Could I have done anything differently to make this not have happened? What is it about me that would make him wanna go? I started to be anybody that I needed to be to be liked. Everything my friends needed me to be, and everything teachers needed to be, and coaches needed to be, my mom needed me to be, 
Make sure people have a great time when they're around you because nobody can disapprove. Nobody can not like me because nobody can leave anymore. My grandfather gave me a Bible for high school graduation. And it was in a box in plastic. And at the time, I wondered why. What was I going to do with that? So I put it away and carried it with my stuff. Anything that felt like family again, that was stuff I was keeping because that's, that's what I desperately wanted. I wanted a wife. I wanted kids. But the fear was that I wasn't a person that could do that. I wasn't worth that. Don't allow yourself to even dream those things because you can't have them. I made a promise to myself that I was not going to do that. I was going to be rich and I was going to be wild and I was going to live an adventure and family wasn't going to be part of that. Heading to college it was all about thrill seeking, extreme partying and death defying adventure. Anything that would make me happy again. I got great new jobs that felt like we're going to be the thing I needed, but it wasn't ever, this is it. We're into the mid to late 90s with a tech boom, and I'm investing in the stock market. I was starting to have literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in an account that could feel like I had something, and it didn't work. There was literally no joy in it. All I thought about was losing it, which brought up all the fear I had about losing my dad and losing the people around me and losing my sense of myself. The breaking point for me was coming home to my mom's house to stay with her and my life being so out of control, she said I couldn't stay there anymore. That started the real questions. That started real questions in my life of where am I going? Where is this all taking me? I remember a friend of mine at work at that point saying, why don't you come to church with me? And church had never been an answer. But I think in my brokenness, I said, I'll go. The guy speaking actually had stuff to say about my life. He said, you can't be a husband the day you get married. And you can't be a father the day that you have a baby. It's got to start before then. That spoke to me. Started thinking about what would my life start to look like now to start preparing for that. It's not this. It is not what I'm doing right now. What I'm doing right now does not lead to any of that. But I thought there was a chance. I felt hope. I felt like I could be more than me or more than what I was. Could I? Wow. I mean, could I get married? God, could you heal me enough? A friend of mine took me out to lunch one day and said, I see you at church all the time. Have you ever given your life to Jesus? I said, no. Do I need to? He said, you should. And you can. Let's do it right now in this restaurant. I left that restaurant and all I could think of was, do I still have the Bible my grandpa had given me for high school graduation. I've been carrying it around for years, so I still have it? I drove home as fast as I could on my motorcycle, found it, opened up the package, still wrapped in the plastic seal, started reading it, couldn't believe it spoke to my life, right where I was at. It was one of those moments where it was God and I, and saying, I've got you. You don't need all that. You don't need anything but me. I realized, I think I really believe this. I think God really does love me. I think I have hope in Him, and I can trust Him. having a family of my own. I've seen over and over again that I can trust him, that he is a good father, that he always was my father. I was mad at him for a long time, left him for a long time, abandoned him for a long time, didn't think of him for years. Yet when I finally 
wanted him, needed him, turned to him, right there. Well, Nate made a great discovery that the, that the Lord really did indeed love him and restored the years the locust had taken away. We leave you today with Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Thanks so much for being with us today. Until next time, I'm Andrew Knox, and we will see you tomorrow on 700 Club Interactive.